Hi there, my name is Kim Lloyd and I am with Montana State University Extension, Lewis and Clark County. If you're not familiar with the Extension office, we are located out at the fairgrounds here in Helena. And um, our office covers a number of topics. So we have agriculture, horticulture. I'm a family and consumer sciences agent. So I cover nutrition education, family finances, and food preservation, which we're talking about today. So um, I wanna focus specifically today on canning and talking about the safe practices of canning because we don't want to make ourselves or our family sick when we are canning food. And there are a couple of things that we should pay attention to. So what I'd like to start about talking about today is we're gonna do, uh, talk about using research-based resources when we are finding our canning recipes. I'm gonna go through both water bath and pressure canning and then um, talk a little bit about the difference of the two. So um, first I wanna to touch on resources. So I think canning's been around for quite a while and the hard part is, is that a lot of recipes have been passed down from generation to generation. And it's wonderful that we have these old resources from our grandmas and aunts and mothers and um, you know old recipes from the past. But canning has really advanced in the past 50 years. So what's really important is that we are using up-to-date resources when we're finding our canning recipes. Another important thing is that with the um, internet and a lot of things being shared, we don't always know if those recipes have been tested for safe. Um, safety. So first thing I want to show are a couple of resources that I recommend when you're starting to can food. And uh, my favorite resource to start using is the University of Georgia. They have a, what it's called a food national center for home food preservation. So they have a ton of great information which you can look up online. Or um, what we have is we have a DVD that they make. It's called So Easy to Preserve. They also do a book um, that's called the same title, So Easy to Preserve. And what's nice about the book and the DVD is it goes through just the basics of canning. So the book you can purchase at the extension office for around $15. You can also come and rent out the DVD if you just wanna brush up on some of your canning skills. Um, but what's nice is since it's from the University of Georgia, it's all research-based and um, information that gives us some safe products to use. Along with that, from the University of Georgia, I also really like using um, Ball, the brand Ball, like canning jars. Um, they make some really great books, and also their website is another good resource. So I brought two examples here today. Um, the Blue Book, Ball Blue Book, has been around for 80 so years. They make a new edition every year. Um, using the most up-to-date Ball Blue Book is recommended. What's fun about these is they come up with kind of um, recipes that are um, for this day and age. So there's some, you know, with um, canning gifts being popular, like giving jellies and jams for holidays, what's really nice is that there's some kind of unique recipes in here. Um, if you're looking for even more resources, they do have a number of books, the company Ball. Um, and this is um, one of the examples that I have at my office that you could rent out or purchase. Um, but there's some really fun, different unique recipes in here as well. Like there's watermelon jelly, um, some basil vinegar, and just some kind of unique things to play around with. So National Center for Home Food Preservation, ball canning, or another resource that is free and easy to find. Um, MSU, Montana State University puts on uh, puts together these things called Mont Guides. And we have a number of different ones that cover um, home gardening, family finances. Um, we also have nine that cover food preservation. And what's nice is these can be picked up for free at the extension office, but they, um, they are also Montana specific. So for example, we have a um, home canning meat, poultry and fish guide. We also have a making jams, jellies, and syrups. And these use Montana specific products. So for the jams and jellies, there's like an example of a choke cherry jam. There's also gooseberries, uh, rose hips, things you'll find out in the Montana woods, um, as well as meat, fish, game, things like that. Um, so there's nine of these guides. We cover 
tomatoes, freezing, drying, making jams, jellies. There's a number of different ones. So if you come down to the extension office, you can pick up any of those free guides. It's a really good place to, if you're just getting started canning or looking for something Montana specific. So now that we've covered research-based resources, it's really important that we're using resources that are research-based because they're tested for both safety. Uh, we want to make sure that the food that we're eating is safe and sharing with friends and family. And we also want to make sure that we're getting the highest quality product, which is a nice thing with these resources. Canning is usually a day's worth of work, especially if you've gardened and um, growing the food yourself. It's really a lot of time and energy that goes into this food. And we want to make sure all that time and energy gets you the highest quality product. So using research-based recipes is good for safety and for getting a high quality product. All right, so why are we so concerned about food safety when we talk about canning? Um, we're concerned because microorganisms are all around us. We can see them, we can't see them, they're all around us right now. Um, and they like to grow in um, foods that, um, you know, where we can't control the acidity, oxygen, um, and the pH level, things like that. So um, we're concerned about it in canned jars because there's a nice environment for microorganisms to grow. And so um, when we can foods, we help it last longer. And if we do it correctly, they're going to um, last longer without spoiling. One of the biggest concerns with canning you may have heard of is Clostridium botulinum, which causes botulism, which is not fun at all to get. So um, what's, um, what we have to be careful of here is that Clostridium botulinum lives in the soil. So you think of your home garden foods. Um, the Clostridium botulinum can get on those foods and then grow in the jars. And what's most scary about it is this toxin um, cannot be seen, you can't smell it, and so you can't tell if a jar has the toxin in it. Whereas if we introduce mold or some kind of virus or bacteria, you'll most often see a physical change in the food. So this is the one that we're really concerned about is this Clostridium botulinum. And um, just to kind of give you a little base of why this is so scary, um, according to the National Center for Home Food Preservation, one milligram of this toxin has, um, can kill up to 655 tons of mice. I'm not sure how they found that out, but just shows you how scary this toxin is. Um, and there are a lot of really ill side effects from um, Clostridium botulinum, one being botulism. And um, what can happen is we can get permanent nerve damage if we are infected with this toxin. Symptoms um, can appear within 12 to 72 hours if we consume a food with this toxin in it. Things such as uh, blurred vision, difficulty swallowing, breathing, all the way down to um, possible death from suffocation. So pretty scary stuff. And I don't want to scare anyone away from canning food at home, but it's just something to think about. I know um, there have been a lot of recipes passed down from family members. And if you look online, there are a lot of fun things out there to can. Um, but we just really want to make sure we're being safe with it because in the end, this food um, cannot be safe to eat if it's done incorrectly. So there are a couple ways we can kill off the botulinum spore. They, we can control the pH of our foods. So botu, Clostridium botulinum does not like to grow in acidic foods. It also can be killed off by heating foods up to a high enough temperature. And so that's why we have a couple of different canning methods. Um, so I have two, type of can, two types of canners up here in front of me. I have a, a water bath canner, and this is used for our um, acidic foods. And then I also have a pressure canner. And the pressure canner is used for our non-acidic foods. And I can go over those here right now. So um, for pH, so we're concerned about pH with our foods and what we can different kinds of foods in. So foods that are acidic includes, uh, include our fruits. So things like apples, cherries, um, lemons, plums, pears, peaches, things like that, those are all considered high acid foods. 
And so foods like those can be canned in a water bath canner. What we're concerned about is foods that are the, um, the low acid. And that includes everything that is a pH of 4.6 or higher. So right on that level of 4.6 are our tomatoes. And tomatoes, um, since there's such a wide variety of them, we consider tomatoes to be a high acid food and therefore they should be canned in a uh, pressure canner. And so with a water bath canner, what we can do is we can can the high acid foods because all we need is we have that acid so the, botu the Clostridium botulinum isn't gonna grow. We, can, um, we just need to heat it up um, and the acid will make them not grow. However, um, with the low acid foods, since we don't have that acid, we need to heat our foods up to um, higher than boiling. And water boils at 212 degrees at sea level. And so in order to get above that boiling temperature, that's when we use a pressure canner. And that pressure canner can reach up to 240 degrees. And that's where our um, toxin or our spores from the toxin can be killed off. So um, another thing that we should be concerned about is the altitude adjustment. And I'm going to go into the whole process of how we can both in a water bath and a pressure canner. But before I move into that, I want to show really quickly um, altitude. So I mentioned that water boils at 212 degrees at sea level. And um, that's great. <laughs> but what happens is here in Helena, we're just above 4,000 feet. So at 4,000 feet, water boils at 204 degrees Fahrenheit. And so what we're concerned about is we're not getting up to a high enough temperature to kill off additional molds and bacteria that might exist on our foods that we can't see. So what we have to do when we're canning is to, um, for a water bath canner, we have to increase the time that we process our food, and that will ensure that our food gets up to the right temperature. And then for pressure canning, we need to make sure that we increase the pressure so the temperature can continue to get up high enough to kill off the toxins. So, um, and the MONT guides that I mentioned earlier, those all show um, information for altitude adjustments and um, any, that's kind of a red flag when you look at a recipe and you're not sure if it's research-based. If it doesn't say anything about altitude adjustments, maybe you should look for a research-based recipe because it's really, really important, especially if you're canning here in Helena or the surrounding areas, that we get um, our altitude adjustments. So let's get into some canning. I wanna walk really quickly through the different parts of a water bath canner and a pressure canner. So um, this guy here, is a water bath canner. Pretty simple, and this is kind of a nice um, gateway to canning. If you have never canned before, or you're thinking you wanna try and get into it, I recommend starting with a water bath canner. So like I said before, uh, water bath canning is for our high acid foods. So that includes when you're doing things like jams and jellies, um, as well as whole canned fruit, like if you do peach or pear slices. It also includes pickles. So if you're not quite ready to graduate to the pressure canner, but you have a bunch of green beans or carrots or beets, just pickling them will add that acid that you need to be able to safely do it in a water bath canner. So yeah, fruits, pickles, um, jams, jellies, these are all great for a water bath canner. So water bath canner is pretty basic. It's just a large kettle. Um, the large surface is nice to fit in a number of jars. It includes a lid. Inside, all we have is a simple rack. It's really important to have a rack for your water bath canner because when we place our jars in, we want water to circulate all around the jars and the rack will keep the jars off of the bottom of the pot. It's especially important if you're canning um, like on an electric stove that um, that heat source is gonna be touching the bottom of the pot and you don't want that to be touching the, directly the bottom of the jars because they could break easier that way. So even just this thin little wire here will keep the jars off the bottom of the pot. If you have a large pot and there's not a rack inside, a couple of other things you can use if you don't wanna invest in a canner. 
one of my favorite things to do is take the lids off of the top of the jar here and um, place the flat side down and line the bottom of the pot with them. And that acts as a rack too, it'll keep them off. Or just crumple up some tin foil and use that as a rack on the bottom too. That works. So I wanna walk through um, the basics of setting up your jars and canning. So when you are canning, um, I think some of the most popular jars you see out there are these canning jars with a two-piece lid. And so these lids come in two pieces. The flat piece is um, what makes the seal. So you'll see there's this little seal around the um, lid of the jar and that's what seals to the glass top. And then the ring part is actually just to hold the lid in place while you're processing. So these are the most common jars that you'll see around are these two-piece lids. There are other common um, kinds out there, but this is what you'll see most often. So I want to walk through really quickly how, we're, how we can, how we set up our jars when we can. So a couple of extra tools that are nice to have but aren't necessary. You can usually buy these things in kits together. Um, I like to start with a, uh, this is a lid, a magnetic lid wand. So if you um, don't want to touch the ring of your lid, this magnet is really nice. Grabs onto the lid, you place it on and let go and you don't have to touch that seal at all. Another great tool is a, um, it gets out air bubbles and it also adjusts your headspace. So this tool is really nice because your recipes should also suggest what kind of headspace you need when you um, can your product. So headspace is basically um, from the top of the product to the top of the jar. And this tool is marked every quarter of an inch here. It has um, a little marking. So for like jams and jellies, your headspace might be a quarter of an inch. If you are pressure canning vegetables, it might be up to an inch. But um, yeah, things like salsas would be closer to a half an inch. So let's pretend I am um, canning a product. Another item is a funnel that's really important to have because you'll see here, we're gonna wanna keep the ring of the jar completely clean and a funnel is just gonna make your life so much easier. And so what we do is we um, will take the product out, put it in the jar. Um, once the product we think is filled to the correct headspace, we'll take the funnel out. You can use your um, air bubble remover and go around the outside here. This is really important, number one, because you want to get as much product into your jar. And number two, you don't want air bubbles in there that might get trapped because it might discolor the food. So using an air, air bubble thing is great. And then you test the headspace. So let's say I'm doing a half an inch. What I want to do is put it on the edge of the jar here and follow it all the way around. And this bottom part here should be touching the bottom of the food. So if you see on some of my canned jars that I have up here already, there is a little head space in between the top of the product and the um, top of the lid there, and that's the head space. That's so important because you don't want your jar to explode in the um, canner, because that's really sad to see too. So once you have your jar filled, the next step is to take a wet rag and wipe around the top of the lid. We want to do this to remove any kind of food particles that might um, obstruct the lid from adhering to the top of the jar. And once our jar is filled, we can use our magnetic wand to place the lid on top of the jar. Just slightly take it off with your finger. Really important, you don't want to um, press down the middle of the jar here because that might create a false seal. And then the um, little ring on there will help to keep the lid in place. So all we do is uh, twist it on. Another important thing to remember is we don't want to crank this down. Because what's going to happen when we place our jars in the canner is um, air is going to need to escape. And so the jar creates a vacuum. And if the lid is down, cranked down too tight, that lid will actually buckle because air is going to get out no matter what, or your jar could break too. Um, you don't want it too loose because then the top of the lid might also wiggle around. So when you screw on your lid, just stop once it's fingertip tight, and then it's ready to go. 
after you've filled all your jars, you want boiling water in the canner so that when you place your jars in, it's another handy tool, it's a little jar grabber, it's nice and rubbery, so you um, can hold on to the jar pretty easily because it's gonna be a hot jar if you're doing a hot pack. What you do when you um, put your jars in the canner is you wanna lift straight up because you just did so much work cleaning off that rim and making sure the seal was clean, straight up and then straight down into the canner. And you should have hot water in there if you're doing a hot product so that the temperature isn't too drastic in there for the jars. And what we do is we set them in so that they are all in the bottom of the canner and um, there is air circulating or water circulating around all of the jars. So you want there to be space around each jar and then also that um, rack on the bottom will um, keep the jars from the bottom of the pan. Once you place all your jars in, the water should be about an inch above the jars. You can use your headspace tool again to gauge if you have that inch or more. Um, if not, I like to have a boiling kettle of water ready to pour on top so that we don't slow down the process. Once you have your canner filled up and the water is an inch above and it's ready to go, you can place the lid on and you wait until it comes up to boiling and that's when you start your time. So if your time for your um, recipe says can for 10 minutes, you have to first remember to make that altitude adjust adjustment so that the water gets hot enough. So if it says 10 minutes and add five minutes on for 4,000 feet, make sure you can for 15 minutes. And that's a continuous boil for 15 minutes. Um, if it stops boiling, you need to start the timer over again and make sure it's a continuous boil. That's so important because that recipe has been tested to get up to that temperature after 15 minutes. After 15 minutes, you turn off the stove. You should wait a couple of minutes for things to settle down and always make sure you lift the lid away from your body because that steam is gonna be really hot. And once the jars have set in there, you can then take them out again with your handy tool you want to still continue straight up and straight down. I recommend setting things on a cloth towel because these jars are hot and your counter is going to be room temperature. Especially if you have like a stainless steel countertop, it's going to be kind of chilly and the bottom of the jar could break from that temperature change. So really important to use a cloth. Once jars are set down out of the canner, we want to leave them there for 24 hours. Don't touch them at all. It's going to ensure that the seal is good. After 24 hours, what we do is um, check the seal. Again, if it's a good seal, the bottom will pop down in the middle here. That tells you it's a good seal. When we store our jars, it's really important to take the ring off. This is for a couple of reasons. So you notice all my jars I have sitting up here um, have the ring off, and this is how I store them in the cabinet. If it's a good seal, that lid's not going anywhere. It's gonna stay tight. If it's not a good seal, you'll be able to tell when the lid moves a little bit that that product is no longer good. If it's been 24 hours and some of your lids have not gone down, it's still okay to eat that food as long as you refrigerate it within 24 hours. You could also reprocess the food, but I don't always recommend that because it can get kind of mushy and not a really desirable texture if you reprocess it. So best if your lid hasn't gone down, to just put it in the fridge and eat that one first. If the lid has gone down, awesome. All you need to do is take your clean wet cloth, wipe out underneath the rim. If there's any kind of food or moisture in there, you'll prevent any kind of mold growing as well. So wipe off the rim, make sure to label. If you put a whole day into canning something, you're like, I'm gonna remember what that is. In a couple of months, you'll probably forget, or at least I do. <laughs> so always label the tops of your jars with the name of the product and the date. I have a salsa jar here. It has a great label on it, and I know when it's done. All right, so last thing I want to talk through really quickly is a pressure canner. So this is a water bath canner, good gateway into canning. If you really want to can your um, carrots or you want to do, uh, maybe you got a bunch of fish and you want to smoke some fish or make some broth, then a pressure canner is what you're going to need to use. 
So a couple different parts to the pressure canner here. We have um, what might be um, a little intimidating here is this is the dial gauge. And so this is what tells us what pressure we're going up to. And um, we want to get up to a certain pressure to make sure we're getting up to that temperature to kill off any Clostridium botulinum spores. So I know um, there are a lot of tales about pressure canners blowing up and um, some scary things. If you get a newer pressure canner, it usually has this little um, pressure release valve um, that's just this little rubber stopper that will just pop out if your pressure canner is about to blow up. And that's pretty rare that that happens. So um, just something to remember that it's not, the whole thing is not going to blow up. Um, besides the gauge, we also have um, the pressure valve there that's going to cover once we get it up um, to the steam we need. And I'll go through that in a second here. And then underneath the lid, um, we have also this rubber gasket that helps make the seal. And just like a water bath canner, we also have a little um, rack on the bottom of the pressure canner to keep the jars off of the bottom of the pot. So pressure canning is a little bit different than water bath canning because there are a couple of extra steps to it and the process takes a little longer. So with pressure canning, it's the same thing. We fill up the jars, check the headspace, straight up, straight down. In a pressure canner, you actually only have a couple of inches of water in the bottom of the pot. Um, and this is because we just need enough water to create a steam inside the pot. It's going to remove all the air and just be steam inside. So once you have your jars in, again, you want space around each of the jars. And the water is in there, and it's hot. We're going to close the lid. Um, I should also mention that there's some older versions and even some newer canners that have, instead of the rubber gasket, they have some little turns around the top. And those are um, a different style of canner that are totally fine to use. So um, once we have the lid on and the jars are in there, we crank up the heat. Important step with pressure canning is we want to release all the air so we have a pure steam environment. Steam's going to be hotter than air, so if it's all steam, it's going to be a good temperature for us. So this little um, steam valve here is going to start shooting out steam. When it's in a V for 10 minutes, pure steam, then we're going to start and put our, um, our valve cover on there. And then um, we're going to start watching the pressure rise. So we'll actually have the gauge will um, start to rise. And in Montana, here at about 4,000 feet, we need to increase the pressure to um, account for the water getting hotter at a lower temperature, or starting to boil at a lower temperature. So um, we process most things at around 13 pounds of pressure rather than 10, like a lot of recipes say. So that's important to keep in mind. Um, once you place this on, it gets up to 13. That's when you start the timer. So a lot of things like smoked fish are for 90 minutes. So you really get to know your stove. You sit there and play with it and try and keep it as close to 13 for 90 minutes. If it drops below 13, you have to start the timer over again. So I recommend trying to keep things around 13 and a half to 14 because it's not fun to have to start over the timer again. Um, but yeah, I mean, canning is, takes a long time if you are in a rush. Um, I don't recommend to can because you really need to sit there and be patient with the process. Um, if you find an old pressure canner in a basement or from a relative or whatnot, what's nice is at the extension office, we actually test these pressure gauges. So if you haven't canned in a while or you have a pressure gauge that you're not sure is correct, bring it down to the extension office and we test it for free against a master gauge that we have from Presto that we test every year. So that's a good thing. Once you're done with pressure, once your time has finished and you've been at that 13 pounds of pressure for 90 minutes or whatever, you turn off your stove um, and then you wait for the dial to come all the way down to zero, which actually can take up to 20 to 30 minutes. It takes a while, so you're in for another half an hour or so. Once it's down to zero, first you take this part off. Um, you'll know if you've took, taken it off too soon because steam will start shooting out. So it's good to wait five minutes after it gets down to zero. And then again, unlock your lid and open it up away from your face to prevent that steam and take the jars out. 
So that is a really basic overview of canning with using a water bath and a pressure canner. And you can see there's a little difference between the two. Um, if you'd like to come pick up any resources or rent out any resources that we have or get your pressure canner gauge checked, you can come visit us at the Extension office. We are at 100 West Custer, which is the fairgrounds, and we're located right next to the fairgrounds ticket office. So um, thank you.